four, three, two, <laughs> one. I'm pressing. Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to our, our adult Sunday school this morning. Uh, Sunday, March, what was that, alleged? <laughs> Allegedly adult Sunday school, right. Uh, yeah, Sunday, March 17th, 2024, and we will be in Luke chapter 4. So we're moving right along in the Gospels of Luke, and we'll be uh, beginning the Lord's uh, earthly ministry. But of course, before that, though, he's uh, tempted by Satan, and we'll be looking, that, looking at that this morning in verses 1 through 13. It kind of reminds me of a little joke. A minister parked his car in a no parking zone in a large city because there was no room and you may have heard this one before and he put so he so he put a note on his windshield uh, that said forgive us our trespasses when he returned he found a citation from the police officer that said lead us not into temptation <laughs> so we're gonna we're gonna see that this morning and even uh, Lita we want to I want to thank you for the bread that 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 you bring here and uh, for you know for the banana bread and it reminds we're also going to look at obviously the Lord uh, man shall not live by bread alone right but if it's Lita's banana bread it's good so, so so that's good but anyways a couple of weeks ago I wasn't here last Sunday uh, we we looked at the family line of the lo of the Lord Jesus Christ going all the way back to the first man Adam and that showed us that Christ is the near kinsman of all of mankind because it traces his lineage back to Adam. And because of um, showing that he is a near kinsman of all mankind, God can, under his prophetic program, redeem all of mankind through the nation of Israel. And that's, and that's how the Lord works in his prophetic program. You would come to God through the nation of Israel. And it also shows, though, that God can redeem all of mankind apart from the nation of Israel, as he does today, through the body of Christ. Because his lineage goes all the way back to the first man, and it shows his humanity. We learn from the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verse 6, on your first cross-reference verse, that the Lord Jesus Christ, he gave himself a ransom for all to be testified or to be revealed in due time and and that's how you know when the Lord revealed himself to the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus that's when uh, God set aside the nation of Israel in unbelief and was now going to work through not through a chosen nation but through the body of Christ and of course in Acts we see the transition of that from God's working with Israel to the body of Christ today. Now at the beginning of uh, Luke chapter 3 we saw the ministry of John the Baptist who was proclaiming if you look on your sheet in Luke chapter 3 verse 3 and he came into all the country about Jordan preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins and we know his job John's job was to prepare Israel for their coming Messiah. Luke also writes, uh, referencing the prophet Isaiah in the next verse, in Luke chapter 3, verse 4, it's, he said, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And as we studied that, we saw that many people came to John to be water baptized. But not the religious leaders, not the, not the Pharisees, the, the priests, or the scribes. We know from later in Luke, in Luke chapter 7, verse 30, we read there, but the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. So if rejecting the counsel of God means that you're rejecting what God's instructions. And if you're rejecting God's instructions, you're not saved. Even today, if you reject if you reject salvation by not trusting in Christ's finished work, you're rejecting the counsel of God against yourself. That's really what you're doing. But under this program, in you know, under God's prophetic program, 
Water baptism was required. That was the counsel of God. They had to do that. Even the Lord Jesus Christ was water baptized. We saw that as we were studying uh, Luke chapter 3. And that kicked off his earthly ministry to the nation of Israel. And he was baptized to fulfill all righteousness or the righteousness of the law because the law required it. In Matthew 3.15 we read there, and Jesus answered, said unto him, and he was telling John this, Suffer it to be so now, so allow him to be water baptized, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. And the Lord Jesus Christ kept the law perfectly, so he had to be water baptized because he was born under the law. Galatians 4.4 4 tells us that God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, and he kept it, as I just said, he kept it perfectly. And this made him the perfect sacrifice for the sins of mankind, because as man, he kept the law. He fulfilled all the requirements. So this morning, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 4, looking at the temptation of the Lord Jesus Christ, covering the first 13 verses. So you want to take your Bibles and open up there because we'll be looking at verse 1 here shortly. Uh, this particular portion of the Lord's life here, his temptation, is recorded in a little bit of detail, both in the Gospel of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, and we'll make reference to that on occasion, and Luke. But it's only briefly mentioned in Mark's Gospel. It's not mentioned in uh, the Gospel of John at all. But in Mark chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, we just read there, and I have that on your cross-reference sheet. And immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness, and he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted of Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered unto him. So that's all that Mark covers of the temptation of the Lord Jesus Christ. So with that, let's go to verse 1 in your Bibles in Luke chapter 4. We read there, And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So it's now at the beginning of his ministry that the Lord Jesus Christ is now full of the Holy Spirit. Because remember what happened to him when he was water baptized. In Luke chapter 3, verse 22, we saw there that the Holy Ghost... or That verse... Is that on your cross-reference sheet? Okay, yeah, you're right. Look in your Bible, sorry. Because of room, I had to take off some of the references in Luke. So if you go back in your Bibles, in Luke chapter 3, verse 22, and I think everybody can turn back a page or so, it's not too hard. It shouldn't take too long. It says there that the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. So we see there, at, that's when the Holy Spirit came upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you might be thinking, well, that's kind of interesting because, you know, what about before? Because you know, we're talking about God in the flesh. Even growing up, we're not talking about an ordinary, well, he was a, an ordinary human being, but yet at the same time, he was God, right? It's hard to wrap our minds around that. But prior to that, though, in the Gospel of Luke, we, we only read a little bit about the Lord's humanity when he was growing up. For example, in your Bibles, look in chapter 2, just a couple of verses there. In verse 40, Luke, Luke wrote, And the child grew, and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. So he waxed strong in spirit, but that's not the Holy Spirit. He, that's talking about you know this, our, our, our human spirit that we have. And in verse 52, it says at the end of that chapter, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature, and in favor with God and man. So we read you know, that the Lord grew, he matured, and he grew in knowledge, obviously. But we read about his humanity, but we never read about any miracles done or anything like that or the Spirit working in that way through the Lord because it wasn't time. In fact, 
uh, John the Baptist didn't even know, really know who he was. I mean, he knew who he was. He knew, okay, this guy is Jesus because they were family, they were relatives. But until, as the Son of God, though, he didn't know him as the Son of God until he was water baptized. Remember in John chapter 1, uh, verses 33 and 34, we read there, John said, And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizes, that baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. So it wasn't until then that John realized that, oh yeah, this is the Son of God. This is who God the Father told me you know, I would be preparing the way for. So it wasn't until the baptism that John knew who he was. So it's interesting that growing up, uh, nobody, you know, he probably wasn't, he wasn't doing miracles. He was just living a normal life as, as a young, or as a child, and then growing up as a teenager and, and as a young man, so up until about the age of 30. Now, here in Luke chapter 4, we read that, you know, the Lord, now that he's full of the Holy Spirit, that he was led in, led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So, I, you know, I believe that this was a supernatural event, sort of like what happened to Philip after baptizing the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8 in verses 39 and 40. We see there, it says, And when they were come out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing, that would be the eunuch, and Philip was found, at, at, at Azotus. So after Philip baptized that Ethiopian eunuch, the spirit just kind of took him away. He was, he, he was out of there. And I think that that's probably what happened here with the Lord Jesus Christ, is that he was led by the spirit now into the wilderness because he would be tempted by Satan, not as the son of God, as we'll see, but as the son of man, because, because the Lord Jesus Christ is 100% God, and 100% man. And, and we'll kind of look at that a little bit here as we continue. So in your Bibles, let's look at uh, verses 2 and the beginning part of verse 3 in Luke chapter 4. Okay, it says in Luke 4 verse 2, being tempted, or being 40 days tempted of the devil, and in those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended, he afterward hungered, and the devil said unto him, and I'm going to stop right there in verse 3. Now we see in verse 2 that the Lord, he was tempted. In other words, he was test. he's now going to be tested by Satan. And the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 4.15, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And in uh, chapter 2, verse 18 of Hebrews, the writer says, For in him, for in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor or aid them that are tempted. So we, we're going to see here, he's going to be tempted 40 days by, by the devil. Now, when I was working on the study Bible, because I, I, I've done the notes for the Gospel of Luke, um, I did a lot of comparing between what, what was written in Luke and what was written in Matthew. Now, Matthew wrote in Matthew verse chapter 4, verses 1, 2, and 3, I have there, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he ha had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward uh, and hungered. And when the tempter came to him. So here in Matthew, it sounds like it's the possibility that he was tempted and he wasn't tempted until the end of the 40 days. You can kind of read it that way in Matthew. You, but Luke's account says that he was tested for the full 40 days. 
And even in Mark's short version of the temptation of Christ, that sort of hints at that as well, that during that whole 40 days, the Lord was being tempted. And I think that that was the case, that it was during this 40-day period that Satan was tempting him. But when the 40 days were ended, we read that the Lord was hungry and then Satan came back again. So it wasn't, it wasn't just a one-time temptation with you know three things. It was a process of temptations throughout those 40 days. But those 40 days aren't covered. It was, it's not until the end of the 40 days when the Lord would be really hungry now. Can you imagine going 40 days without food? And without water, I mean, I, I can't imagine, I can't imagine that. So it should be expected that he'd be quite hungry. Um, but not only it was the Lord, the Lord was not the only one that, that had done something like this. Uh, Moses did as well. He went 40 days without food and water. In Deuteronomy chapter 9, if you look at verse 18, we read there, <coughs> excuse me, and I fell down before the Lord as at the first, forty days and forty nights. I did neither eat bread nor drink water because of all your sins which ye sinned in doing wickedly in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. And Moses was talking about when uh, he, went up, he went up to Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments and Israel made that golden calf. So Moses actually ended up going up to the up twice and he, there were two 40 day periods where Moses ate no food and drank no water I, I still can't imagine doing that because man I have I have a hard enough time sitting through a church service and you start getting hungry and you're like and you're like watching your clock or watching your cell phone you know when's the pastor gonna end so we can go eat you know right but anyways but in the fact that the Lord hungered though he showed his humanity just in the fact that he was hungry. Even later on in his ministry, in Matthew 21, 18, when uh, uh, we read there, now in the morning as he returned into the city, and that would be Jerusalem, he hungered. So the Lord experienced hunger, just like us. In Matthew eight twenty four, we read there, and behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, so a great storm, insomuch, that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. Now, why would you sleep? Because you're tired, right? So the Lord was tired. He's showing his humanity. And in John 11, verse 35, when, when he came to, uh, to the house of Lazarus, we, Jesus wept. That's one of the easiest verses to memorize in the Bible. Just two words. Jesus wept. But again, what does that show? His humanity. And the interesting thing about that is that Jesus knew he was going to raise him from the dead, right? He would have known he was going to do that. But yet, he still showed his humanity. He showed his emotions. So let's go on uh, to verse 3 here, and let's look at the first of these three temptations that are recorded for us in Luke. Okay, we read there, and the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. So first let's look at that phrase, Son of God, which is used at quite frequently in the Gospels and in Paul's letters as well. We see it four times in, Port, in Paul's letters. Um, the only one I have down in, in the full version is in Romans 1.4 and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. And I have the other references there too as well. But this title, what it does though, is it shows that he is God in the flesh. And that's important to remember, because many times in the New Testament, the Lord Jesus Christ is shown to be God in the flesh. Even, in fact, even when that title isn't used many times in the Gospels, it, the, the fact that Jesus is God is, is clearly seen. And even in Paul's letters, in fact, in Titus chapter 2 verse 13 tells us believers to be looking for that blessed hope 
and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is our Savior and he's God. You know, they're all tied into the same into the same person. So the many people who deny that the, Lord, that the Lord Jesus Christ is God, they're not going to have an excuse at, at the time of judgment because it's clearly stated in the Gospels and even in Paul's writings who he is. In fact, the Jews were witnesses that were witnesses to his earthly ministry. They understood what he, what he meant when he called himself God's son. In John chapter 5, uh, in verses 16 through 18, we read there, And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him, because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. But Jesus answered them, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. So they well understood what he was talking about. In John chapter 10, in verse 32, Jesus answered them, Many good works have I shown you from my Father, for which of these works do ye stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. So they well understood what the Lord was, was talking about. And even before his, his, even at his trial before Pilate, we read in John, 10, or John 19, verse 7, the Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. So they knew exactly what he was talking about when he said that. And, you know, the religious leaders were actually, they were right in one sense because any person that claimed to be God, they were to be, they were to be stoned, they were to be killed. However, with the Lord Jesus Christ, he could claim that because he is and was God in the flesh. Now here in our text, uh, Satan knew that Jesus was the Son of God. I mean... There, you know, I, he, he would know that. It, it, it wasn't something new revealed to him. He w and he wasn't even questioning that. He wasn't even questioning if he was the Son of God. Just as the unclean spirits didn't question whether he was the Son of God. In fact, the unclean spirits and the demons that the Lord encountered in his earthly ministry, they knew exactly who he was. In fact, in Mark 3 verse 11, it says there, and the unclean spirits, when they saw him, they fell down before him and cried, saying, Thou art the Son of God. So if, if they knew, Satan knew as well that, that he was the Son of God. So Satan didn't need convincing in that way. But what Satan was doing, though, is that he was tempting him as the Son of Man. He was challenging his humanity to see if maybe he could get his humanity to slip. Just like what happened with Adam and Eve, right? That's what he was trying to do. Because we know from Hebrews uh, chapter 2, verse 17, it's not on your sheet, but um, he was made like his brethren. In other words, he was 100% human too. So Satan is now going to tempt him, not as the son of God, because Satan knows as the son of God he's not going to be able to do it, but he's going to tempt him as the son of man. He's going to tempt him in his humanity. And this is really Satan's method of operation. Uh, we're going to see that here in a couple of things. One, it, and we'll see Satan as he does this with the Lord, is to cast doubt on the word of God. And that's what happened way back in the garden in Genesis chapter 3 verse 1. Remember Satan told the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now he said that to the woman, but Adam was there too. We know from you know from the from the account. But what was Satan doing there? He was casting doubt on the word of God, and that same method of operation it continues today, right? I mean, to cast doubt on the word of God, and those attacks, <clears throat> excuse me, go all the way back to Genesis. 
you know, we could say, you know, did God really create the heavens and the earth in six days? You know, is that not attacked through theories like evolution and things like that to cast doubt on the word of God? Or even some may say, oh, the Bible contradicts itself in, in, in these passages. And again, that's an attack on the word of God itself. It's casting doubt on God's word. And we need to be aware of these traps, folks. In 2 Corinthians 2.11, uh, Paul writes, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So, you know, Satan not only uses unbelievers, but he can use believers as well. We have to be aware of that. And this verse is not on your cross-reference sheet, but 2 Timothy 2.26, uh, believers, uh, sometimes they need to be recovered from the snare of the devil, right? So what does that tell us? That believers can even be tricked by Satan into believing things that are not true. So we need to be careful of that. And don't think, we have to be careful also not to think that, oh, well, that could never happen to me, right? Well, don't, don't say that because pride goeth before the fall and you know, we can all fall into that trap. And that's why it's important to have on the full armor of God. In Ephesians 6.11, Paul tells us to do exactly that, to put on the armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles or the tricks of the devil. So you want to have on the full armor to be able to withstand those attacks. And Satan's ways haven't changed either, in that besides casting doubt on God's word, he also appeals to three areas of life. He appear, appeals to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, just as John writes about in 1 John 2.16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So in other words, it's from Satan. So Satan appeals to those areas. So let's look at Satan's uh, attempt here in Luke 4, verse 3, his first one. He tells the Lord, Man, I don't know how he went 40 days without water. Yeah. Oh, boy. Of course, he, of, course, of course, he might not have been talking to too many people if he was by himself. So maybe that, maybe, maybe that was it. He didn't have to talk a lot. But anyways, uh, Satan told the Lord, or asked him to command this stone that it be made bread. And since the Lord was hungry, Satan's first appeal was to the Lord's sense of, or Lord's feeling of being hungry, his desire for food. And this was nothing new under the sun, just as, you know, Adam just as Satan did with Adam and Eve back into the garden too. What did he do? He used he used an apple there, right? Or not an apple, a fruit. I know. See what I mean? I get caught up even in man's traditions by mistake. An apple. I don't know why I feel bad for apples. I think they get a bad rap. Because apples shouldn't... I mean, I always like to think... I mean, what's, what's a fruit that tastes bad? Po pomegranate. Yeah, maybe it was a pomegranate or something like that. You know, something that doesn't taste good. But anyways, so what Satan did, though, was he used something as innocent as food, right? You stop and think about man fell into sin by taking a bite of a piece of fruit, which, you know, as, as a grandparent, you know, I might laugh if my grandkids take a bite of something that they're not supposed to, but God doesn't laugh at that because it's disobedience, and, and, that's, and that was what the issue was. In Genesis uh, 3, 6, we read, we read there, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. We see there Satan appealing to those three things. Now, the Lord had a very good answer, though, for Satan in, in Luke chapter 4, verse 4. We read there, And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written. And on my notes, I even have that highlighted. It is written, because we're going to see that over and over again. The importance of using God's word. And Jesus, uh, and Jesus said here, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. 
So each time that the Lord used this or uses this phrase, it is written, you see, I mean, we see that the issue isn't food itself. You know, food's not the problem or being hungry and eating is not the problem. But what, what the issue is, is obedience to God. And here, the Lord made a reference to Deuteronomy, a lesson to the book of Deuteronomy and a lesson that Israel learned in their 40-year wilderness wanderings, or should have learned at least, Moses told them in Deuteronomy 8.3, he said, And he, that being the Lord, humbled thee, that being Israel, and suffered thee to hunger, and to feed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. So they needed to learn, and we need to learn this as well, is to learn to trust God the Father and to trust his written word. And that's a good principle. In 1 Corinthians 10.11, Paul writes there, Now all these things happened unto them for examples or examples. And they are written for our admonition. And, of course, Paul was writing about there in 1 Corinthians 10 about how Israel tempted the Lord in the wilderness, right? And all those things are, are our examples today as members of the body of Christ. But instead of trusting the word of God, and I'm talking about Israel now, when they were in the wilderness, what did they do when they were hungry? Did they trust the Lord? No, what did they do? It's really simple, complain. That's what they did, they complained. And that's well recorded in the first five books. I mean, I, I could give you a 20-page cross-reference sheet with, with all the complaints that they had to Moses when they were in the wilderness. But, you know, we can learn from that because what does Paul say in the book of Philippians? Don't complain, right? In Philippians 2.14, do all things without murmurings and disputing. You know, that may be one of the hardest things not to do, if you stop and think about it, because it's not classified, you know, because we, we, we classify sins, right? If somebody has an affair, or somebody robs a bank, or somebody steals or something from someone, or somebody kills somebody, we have those sins, right? But murmuring and complaining, when you read the accounts in the first five books of the Bible, boy, you talk about making the Lord angry. That made the Lord very angry. And, you know, he punished Israel for that. Now, today under grace, thankfully, we're not under that same program. But still, the Lord does not like murmurings and complainings. He does not want us grumbling about our situation. You know, and, you know, the Lord, what did he do when he was hungry? Was he like Israel and did he complain? No, what he referenced the word of God when he answered Satan. And so when something's not going right for you, when, some, when something's not going right for me, what do we do? Do we complain or do we, or do we refer to and meditate on God's word, which is what we really need to do, just like the Lord did here. You know, he didn't complain and go like, oh yeah, you know what, you're right, I am so hungry. No, he told Satan, that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth from God. In other words, from God's word. So, that one did not work. So, we go continuing in Luke chapter 4, verse 5. It says there, And the devil, taking him up into an high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, all this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. So that's quite an offer there, if you stop and think about it. And, you know, although Satan is not God, we know that, and he's not as powerful, but still, Satan is powerful, so we always have to keep that in mind. And he showed this, he showed his power here by showing all the kingdoms of the world 
very quickly. That's what it means by a moment in time. In other words, he showed he sh the Satan showed the Lord everything just like that at a snap of a finger. He saw it all. So what Satan's or what what Satan appealing to here? Well, he's really offering the Lord a chance to avoid the cross and to immediately rule the earth. He's appealing to the pride of life. You know, wouldn't it be nice to immediately rule these kingdoms so that way you don't have to go to the cross and you you don't have to suffer those things? But he offered them these kingdoms right away. Now, two things that are sometimes asked about this offer that Satan that Satan made. Did Satan lie about the power and the glory of the kingdoms being delivered to him? Any thoughts? No, he didn't. Satan was not lying at all. This was a very legitimate offer. Uh, before the fall into sin, Adam and Eve, they were given dominion over the earth. We read in Genesis 1.28, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, To be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. But, they were given dominion, but when man fell into sin, what happened? He lost, he lost his dominion. So, since that time, Satan has been the god of this world, and that's why Paul calls him that in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. He calls him, I just have the shortened version there, the, the god of this world. It's that simple. He, Satan is the god of this world. And it's sad to say that most are following him and don't and don't even realize it. And in that case, I may be talking about unbelievers, but believers have to be careful too not to get caught in the snare of the devil and becoming so concerned about the things of the world. Because where does Paul tell us in Colossians chapter three in the beginning in verses one through four to keep our mind where? on things above, right? So it's very easy to get caught up in this evil age, which is what Paul calls it in Galatians 1.4, where we read, who gave himself, that's being Christ, gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, or evil age, as is also what it means there. You know, things are not going to get better in, in this world. Christianity is not going to make this world a better place to live. It's just not going to happen. But thankfully, we're going to be delivered from this evil world, whether it's through physical death or at the rapture and we meet the Lord in the air. So while you're still here on this earth, why not proclaim the gospel? Make it known. You know, why not, why not do that? That's the thing that we have to worry about. Not be, I mean, we want to be concerned about, you know, our world, le about our leaders in our country and things like that, but not so overly worried about them that we lose focus of what's really important, and that's making the gospel known. Because, you know what, kid you not, even in seven or eight or ten years from now, no one's going to care about this, you know, say the upcoming election. No one's, it's going to be water under the bridge, no one will care about it. But you know what will matter? is eternity and spreading the good news. So, you know, if you're sitting here or if you're listening on radio, or not on radio, but on video, if you're watching on video, remember, uh, if you're not saved, believe that Christ died for your sins and rose again. And the moment you believe that, you can have eternal life. So that's, that's the good news. You know, and it's good, but it is good to warn people, though, that they need to be saved out of this evil age and from God's righteous judgment that's coming. Just as Paul warned the Athenians, I mean, those Athenians had no background in anything about the Lord, but yet Paul still told them in Acts 17.31, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. So don't be afraid, even if to an unbeliever or to someone, when you're talking to someone who may not know much about the Bible itself or about the Lord Jesus Christ, 
don't be afraid to talk about God's judgment because God's judgment is coming and that's what we need to be saved from. Now we see the Lord's response here to uh, Satan's offer of the kingdoms. He says, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Now this phrase, Get thee behind me, Satan, is only used one other time. And you know who, and of course you know who I'm probably referring to. In Matthew 16, 23, that's when the Lord turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. And again, the Lord, here in this case, the Lord used the written word to counter Satan's attack. The Lord had in mind passages like Exodus 20, verse 3, where we read, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Exodus 34, 14, For thou shalt worship no other god. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. And in Deuteronomy 6.13, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shalt swear by his name. So you're to worship the Lord only. Now today, you know, we, even as believers, we need to be careful of idol worship. Not just the statues of false gods, whether it's in the United States, because believe it or not, even in our country, people worship little statues. You know, we, we see that. And Anywhere in the world, you go to many countries and they worship idols and false statues. But remember, though, that after reminding us, and we just talked about this, about keeping our minds on things above, what does Paul say in Colossians 3, 5? To mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is what? Idolatry. So if you really want something and you're coveting it, you know what you're doing? That's idol worship. You're, you're, and all that is, is placing something, anything. It can be a person, even, in front of the Lord Jesus Christ, in front of God. That's what idol worship really is. Now, finally, uh, we see in Luke 4, 9, and they were probably traveling very fast. He brought, uh, Satan brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a pit on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him if thou be the son of God remember he's not he's not questioning it he's saying okay well since you're the son of God cast thyself down from hence here what Satan's doing is he's tempting Jesus to test his father God the father and what's Satan appealing to the lust of the eyes because what that is, is it's an appeal to see or look on things outside of the will of God. And, and that would be the case here in testing God the Father this way. He's like, okay, God, you know, he, Satan was testing the Lord to go up there, throw himself out off the pinnacle of the temple, and to test his heavenly Father to, to see if he would catch him, to see if he would save him. Now... Now, you maybe you're wondering, well, what would this even mean to test God in this way? Well, Israel tested God many times, and you know what? It never pleased God at all when Israel tested him, and they did that by complaining. In Exodus 17, verse 2, it says there, Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do ye tempt? the Lord. In Psalm 106 verse 14 uh, the psalmist writes there but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert and he gave them their request but sent leanness into their souls. So you know when Israel complained let's say about not getting the food that they wanted remember God sent quail to them but and he gave it to them so much that they were just sick of it after a while. And he sent leanness to their soul. So God answered their request, but it was not good. Because they, they, they were testing God. And now Satan's attempt, uh, Satan is tempting the Lord to do what Israel essentially did. And that is to test God the Father. 
And in doing this, Satan even quotes scripture now. So Satan he might have been catching on to what the Lord was doing. And Satan says in verse 10 in Luke 4, For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Satan was using the psalm. In Psalm 91, verse 11 and 12, we read, For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. And I have that highlighted there for a reason. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Because, I, you know, I have that phrase, to keep thee in all thy ways, in verse 11, highlighted, because Satan left out that phrase of, of that psalm in all thy ways, because those ways did not include the sin of testing God the Father, which takes us to the Lord's answer in verse 12 in Luke chapter 4. And Jesus answering said unto him, It is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And, you know, as we've seen, Israel did this many times in Scripture, and today we're warned not to not to do the same thing. In 1 Corinthians 10, 9, Paul tells us, neither, neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. And maybe you're wondering, well, how in the world do we tempt? How, you know, how do we tempt Christ? Well, we do it when we do things like complain and grumble about our circumstances. That's what we're doing. And by doing that, we're grieving the Spirit of God. As it says in Ephesians 4.30, that we're not to grieve God's Spirit, right? It says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Now, we can't lose our salvation when we grumble and complain. God's not going to punish us that way. But I can tell you right now, and even from experience, that when we grumble and complain, our walk in the Lord is not going to be very. Mu it's not going to be much fun. We're going to be most miserable, and you know that. And that's the result of reaping what you're sowing. If you're complaining and grumbling, you're going to be miserable in your walk with the Lord. Now, this entire passage, um, this temptation of the Lord, it shows us the importance of God's word. It really does, because today Satan works to tempt believers to sin and to walk in the flesh and that's why it's important for us to put on the full armor of God and to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. I think Paul says that in Colossians 3.16 and when we do that, when we put on that armor of God, those fiery darts that Satan tries to use to take advantage of us they can just simply bounce right off and not have an effect on us. Now finally in verse 13 we read here in Luke 4 and when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. Now that could simply mean, um, it could mean a couple things. Um, some think that that meant when Satan entered Judas later on in Luke chapter 22, verse 3. But it also, and I think maybe that this is what Luke's talking about, it's a reference to all the evil angels and the demons that the Lord encountered in his earthly ministry. So they were always, you know, tempting man, temp tempting the Lord. In Luke 8.30, it says there, And Jesus asked him, saying, What is thy name? And he said, Legion, because many devils were entered into him. Now, we don't read of them tempting the Lord, but yet he was battling those satanic forces throughout his earthly ministry. And that and it shows us really the spiritual battle that was going on during the Lord's earthly ministry because Satan knew God's word. Satan knew that who Christ was, that he was the Messiah and that, you know, the promise of the Holy Spirit under the prophetic program. So what did Satan do? He filled men with his spirit, with this with the demon possession to challenge the Lord during the Lord's time on earth. So Satan Satan was doing, was copying God. And you know, today, we know that Satan copies God, not by demon possession, but by, uh, by um, people who appear as angels of light, 
proclaiming false gospels and false things like that. So we want to keep an eye out for that as well. So with that, let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word and what we can learn from it, Lord. And just help us, Lord, as believers, not to murmur, help me, not to murmur and complain, Lord, but to keep our minds on things above. And, and when we do that, Lord, we know that our walk with you will be much more enjoyable. And Lord, we pray for those who maybe haven't believed the gospel, Lord, that they would trust in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ for their sin. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.